Interesting that when you talk about the tribe of Dan, I think uh, some people might be very surprised, people of Irish origin, that actually what is written in the Bible about the tribe of Dan actually refers to them. Because in Genesis chapter 49, verses 16 through 18, Jacob prophesied, he said, in the last days, meaning in our days, he says, in the last days, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And he also says, Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse heel so that the rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O eternal. Now, brethren, all these three elements we've read are very relevant, very important, and prophetic of, as we said, the last days, the descendants of Dan in the last days. Now, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, actually means that Dan has equal status, even though he was born to Bilha, and she was a handmaid, as you remember, not a wife. So he still has equal status. According to Strong, judge can mean to rule or to strive as at law, or plead the cause. And then we have this second element, that Dan, Dan, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, that will be biting you know, the horse's heel, so the rider fall backward. And then we have the third element, I have waited for thy salvation, O eternal. It is all very interesting, brethren, how all that has been and is being fulfilled in our day and our age. So, you know, in type, we have a Danite, Samson, that he was from the tribe of Daniel, find in Judges chapter 13, verse 2. So, in type, you know, Samson, Danite, did judge and avenge his people against the Philistines. It's all described in Judges chapter 13 through 16. And Samson's guerrilla tactics of warfare were successful for the small against the big and the few against the many. That's better like a serpent that makes a rider fall by biting the horse's heel. You see, the tribe of Dan was also small and few, so they needed to be cunning. In the sense of rulers, the Irish have become judges in disproportionate numbers to their population. I don't know if you know, but of those who signed the American Declaration of Independence in 1776, four were Irish and nine of Irish descent. Irish Americans feature prominently in all aspects of economic, professional and political life. Large-scale immigration, emigration to Canada, Australia and New Zealand also took place in the 18th and 19th centuries. And many people of Irish descent have made distinguished contributions to public life in these countries. And of the seven prime ministers who came to power in Australia between 1929 and 1949, Believe it or not, six were of Irish descent. This is all written in Ireland by brief by the Department of Foreign Affairs, fact sheet, January 1986, page 16. Anyway, I've got all those references, so I won't be reading to them. Again, I might just mention them in a passing comment, but you'll get them in, a written, in written notes. Now, also the names of two of those Irish are, for example, J.J. Curtin, 1941-45, and J. Alliance, from 1931-1939, were, those were the Prime Ministers of Australia, of Irish descent. This will probably be a revelation to some of you in, in Australia. Now also, here is some more. How about you in America? Ten of early American presidents were of Protestant Northern Irish descent. It's written in a book, Ireland, by Lillian Fox Quigley. Ten. Jackson, Polk, Grant, Wilson, Buchanan... Andrew Johnson, Arthur Cleveland, Harrison, and McKinley. Now, American President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, well-known, was also Irish, as also was Ronald Wilson Reagan. Did you know that? Speaking of Kennedy, I'm not sure if you know, brethren, but the capital of Serbia, there is a street named after John Kennedy. And in about a couple of, couple of months... A new boulevard, which is being built in Belgrade, will also be named after your great president, Woodrow Wilson, who was a great friend of Serbian people and Serbian land. Now, I have to correct myself. I told you that the Serbian flag was the only one that was ever, uh, other than American, that was uh, flaunted from the White House. But I was wrong. There was another country uh, which was honored in such a way, believe it or not, and that country was France. So other than 
Serbian flag other than American flag from the White House the only honor to have their flags being posted on the White House during the history of America are basically French and Serbian flags flags so you should know that and uh, again oh yes uh, also Roosevelt your president Roosevelt there is a famous street in the capital of Belgrade of Serbia which is named after President Roosevelt I'm telling you this because you might be not be aware of that and you might be thinking that perhaps you know this part of the this part of the world is oblivious to some of your history or have no idea about American history no no that's not true we in the schools we do did have as part of our curriculum we did have studies of the American history at least of some basic stuff so yes Woodrow Wilson's Boulevard will be inaugurated in Belgrade in about a couple of months and I'll make sure that I'll make sure that you get that information on time. Uh, Roosevelt Street is there and uh, you know part of Belgrade called New Belgrade has a street named after after your president John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Also there was a Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney who was also Irish and also there was Thomas Tip O'Neill he was Irish but never president. Also Philip Sheridan son of Irish immigrants, was the Union Cavalry General in the Civil War in America. Now, in the sense of Irishmen who have pleaded the cause of defendants or plaintiffs by striving at the law, we need to be aware, brethren, that many Irishmen became lawyers because they were, they were being highly dramatic and favored with oratorical prowess, and then many young men used their talent, talent well. So, uh, you know, many of them became, they became judges. Uh, so that's also written in this Lillian Fox Quigley's book, Ireland. Many Irishmen also have also become policemen or judges to such an extent uh, that it is proverbial to associate, at least in America, it is proverbial to associate the name O'Reilly or Mullo or Mullo with the neighborhood policemen. Perhaps it would be within the framework of this prophecy to say that writers also plead the cause and give a judgment too. Uh, I'm sure that you have heard of all these names, like, you know, James Joyce, George Bernard Shaw, William Butler Yeats, Oscar Wilde, Samuel Beckett, etc. Well, brethren, you see, Ireland has produced a disproportionately large number of internationally famous authors for a country of her size. And the names I've just mentioned are just the top of the list. It may be also correct to say that, you know, inventors are rulers or judges in a sense, and that leaders in business are rulers. Well, among the successful Irish of the business world was William Grace, founder of the Grace Steamship Line. He was also the first Catholic mayor of New York City in the 1880s. When a 20-year-old youth, James Butler, came to America and organized the first chain store, his system was to sweep across the country. And again from Ireland came a boy of only 14 years. His name was Michael Kudahi, and he took a job in a meat packing plant in Milwaukee. He developed a process for curing meat under refrigeration and became the head of the Kudahi Packing Company. A dry goods, you know, merchant whose Irish parents lived in Baltimore. He became a banker in Washington, D.C. and began, built uh, in the nation's capital the Cor Coran Gallery of Art, named for him. Now, we find many inventions, brethren, are also the talents of the Irish. For example, Robert Fulton, his tailor father, came over from Kilkenny. Robert Fulton made steam navigation a reality. A son of another Irish emigrant was Cyrus Hall McCormick, and he invented the farm implement which developed the West, a mechanical reaper. Rubber heels were invented by Humphrey O'Sullivan. The hurricane lamp used by railroad men was the invention of Michael Hicks. And from Rockery, Ireland, came young John Robert Gregg, whose system of shorthand notations is now used the world over. This is all again in the book Ireland by Lillian Fox Quigley. So, brethren, we see that Dan has judged and ruled his people in politics, the legal profession, literature, law enforcement, business, and inventions. So, Rachel, in Genesis 49, verse 17, Rachel he was correct when she said, God has judged me and has heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, called she his name Dan. 
sorry, that is in Genesis 30, chapter 6. <laughs> uh, chapter 30, verse 6, that is. Genesis 36, Rachel's words about Dan. But, you know, how have the Irish been a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse heels so that the rider shall fall backward? Well, some of us who live, who live through a, uh, some of us who have the background in history and our ancestors being, being involved in the partisan movement and partisan struggle against the occupation of the Nazi Germany will be able to tell you about this, how it is. Well, you see, because it is a guerrilla kind of warfare, partisans were actually guerrilla warfare that you have to wage if, you're of, if your power is uh, smaller than the power of your enemy, as our power was. So, you know, Dan used, used guerrilla warfare. And if you know anything from the Irish history, there was a guerrilla warfare uh, that they had against the British. Now, something else. Well, brethren, Dan introduced idolatry into the land of Israel on a regular, official basis. And this is so important, so I'm going to read to you in Judges, chapter 18, just to show, show to you how they were the first tribe. And in fact, if you take a, take a Jewish literature, sometimes the tribe of Dan, or the term Dan, is used for idolatry. In Judges, chapter 18, Verse, we're going to read verse 30 and verse 31. It is the Danites adopt Micah idolatry. So in verse 30, chapter 18, we read that the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land, until the day of the captivity by the Assyrians. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. The house of God was in Shiloh after the death of Joshua. And yet, in spite of that, Danites, as you see, brethren, started their separate, parallel idolatry. And they practiced that, you know, on regular official basis. And it was also in Dan that Jeroboam, you might remember, the first Israelitish king, the first king of the separated kingdom of Israel, Northern Kingdom. It was in Dan that Jeroboam, who led the rebellion that culminated in the divided kingdom, set up one of his two golden calves. It's described in 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 28 through 30. Now, furthermore, we find Dan had a Levite priest, priest under quotation mark, who was also called Father. We're in chapter 18. Look at verse 19, brethren. They're talking about, uh, and they said to, they're talking to Micah, be quiet, put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man or you to be a priest to a tribe and a family in Israel. So they had a father, you see, brethren. Whom do they say, whom do they call father today? In verse 20, we see that this father, under quotation mark, also had an ephod. So the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod, the household idols, and the carved image, and took his place among the people. Well, brethren, even today, about 95% of the population of Ireland are Roman Catholics who call the Pope Father. So they have the priest, you know, the false priest, the false Christianity, the false father. And less than 4% of, of, of Irish people are, are Protestants, by the way. So you see the history, they're, being, they're fulfilling exactly uh, that part which it says that Dan is going to wait for his salvation. They're such staunch Catholics, brethren, that it's just uh, the work of God, you know, in Ireland. I know, I'm not sure what, if there was any fruits of that. But yeah, we do have one. We do have one person who is in Ireland and, and he contact me, contacted me recently. He was in England when I was in England. He remembers me. I don't remember him, of course, because I met so many people. But nevertheless... He was in England, obviously, when he heard the gospel. Now he lives in Ireland. He is originally Irish. We also see in the serpent and adder symbolism, an allusion, as I said, brethren, to guerrilla warfare and evil rebellion. Indeed, you see, Irish history is full of violence of this kind. 
Their liberation from British rule was achieved as the result of a struggle extended over several centuries and marked by numerous rebellions. As you know, they had the Easter Rebellion. It was an uprising of Irish nationalists on Easter Monday, April 24, 1916, when Sinn Féin became the most influential political party in that country. Then in January 1990, the Sinn Féin members of the parliament assembled in Dublin, proclaiming the independence of Ireland, and there followed guerrilla attacks by Irish insurgents, later called the Irish Republican Army, RRA, on British forces, particularly the Royal Irish Constabulary, called the black you know the black and tans in any case you know the warfare against the british continued until july 1921 then a truce was arranged and then ratification of a peace treaty brought into being the irish free state you know which however continued to have these rifts with great britain and uh, there is you know there is the whole whole history now behind that but the most important thing is that uh, there was the withholding of the payment of annuities that the british claim were legally due to them and that withhold withholding led to a protracted tariff war between two countries now through a treaty adopted in april 30, 1938 the tariff war between ireland and great britain was concluded and, you know, the slight improvement in relations between the two nations was marred by a violent terrorist campaign in Great Britain conducted by the RRA. And an in increase in violence between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland was followed by IRRA terrorist activity in the Irish Republic. And therefore, in the late 70s and early 80s, the Irish government faced increased domestic terrorism, of course, by those Irish extremists, resulting in large part from the collapse of representative government in Northern Ireland and the reimposition there of direct British rule. So you see that's their history with Britain is pretty much marred with blood. Now Dan is often listed last in any tribal listings when we talk about the listings of the tribes of Israel. In Numbers chapter 10 verse 25 we'll find Dan La listed last and i mentioned already this third element in that prophecy in the last days i have waited for the, thy salvation o eternal brethren that refers in type you know to the fact that the tribe of dan was the last to receive its inheritance in the promised land you read about that in joshua chapter 19 they were the last now also in first chronicles chapters 2 through 10 from chapter 2 to chapter 10 there is their genealogies, you know, related to the house of Israel, and Dan is omitted from the genealogies. Dan is also in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 through 8, absent from the 144,000 sealed and protected from the day of the Lord. It says that there will be 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. However, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned there. Why is this, brethren? Well, this is because of Dan's idolatry and treacherous guerrilla warfare. In fact, just as anciently, the Assyrian invasion of the modern Israelite nations may come from Ireland, because Dan was first the one who was first invaded by the ancient Assyrians. There is one interesting prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 8, the verses 16 and 17. He speaks about the snorting. He says the snorting of his horses, horses was heard from Dan. For they are come and have devoured the land, speaking of the ancient Israel, but this might be brethren dual prophecy, and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell in it. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Eternal. So that's in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Well, perhaps the Irish will betray the English to the Europeans, that is, brethren, Germans. There was a plan, I've read about it, there was an Irish Nazi party, by the way, during the Second World War. There was a plan to allow the Germans, through the Irish territory, to invade and make a blitzkrieg sudden attack on English. That was an ancient plan. Perhaps it might come to fruition in the years ahead of us, brethren. Now Moses, as you know in Deuteronomy chapter 33, 
prophesied about each particular tribe of Israel. And in verse 22, Deuteronomy 33, verse 22, Moses prophesies, it says, Dan is a lion's whelp, he shall leap from Bashan. Now, this is amazing how in the world history, this prophecy of Moses' brethren was fulfilled. In Judges chapter 18, verse 1, this occurred in type when the Danites sought an inheritance to dwell in, and then they made a leap from the northern Bashan area and attacked the city called Laish, like a lion's whelp would. Laish, Judges 18, verse 27, 28. And in verse 29, you'll find that then they dwelt there and changed the name to Dan. So they changed the name Laish to Dan. And we, when we talked about the house of Israel and the waymarks of Israel, I told you how uh, Danube, the river, Dan, the river of Danube, is one of those waymarks that show us where the, uh, the direction of the migrations of the tribes of Israel, including the tribe of Dan, from their from the land where they were taken captive by the Assyrians. They were taken captive to the shores of the Caspian and the Black Seas, brethren. And from there they made their way to the northwest Europe and to the British Isles. And from the British Isles then they colonized the whole world because Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, were prophesied to colonize the whole world. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the river, the river Danube, the river Danube, uh, the most beautiful banks are in the river Danube. And by the way, uh, yesterday or two days ago, uh, the largest gorge, the ra largest gorge in Europe, it's found in Serbia, it's called Djerdab. Djerdab is the gorge of the river Danube and uh, it has been now uh, listed as one of the protected areas of uh, UNESCO. So now it's recognized by the United Nations as an uh, ecological, ecological national park. That's the first such, you know, such park in Serbia. And the uh, banks of River Danube, as well as that, that Djerdab Gorge, uh, the banks of the River Danube are the most beautiful in Serbia. Danube flows through 10 countries. But if you look at the, uh, how, uh, how it meanders through those countries, it does look like a serpent, like a serpent in a sense. So that river was used to be called Ishtar, after the horrible goddess, pagan goddess mentioned in the Bible as the uh, worst kind of paganism of course because here is the whole horde of, of god baal the sun god baal to whom israelites and other pagan nations unfortunately sacrificed their firstborn children nevertheless you see the tribe of dan renamed that river danube to give us a way mark to show us where uh, to show us the route uh, the way uh, of the Israelitish migrations from the area of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea to their new lands, Northwest Europe, British Isles, and later America. So, anyway, here is the first leap we see in the Bible. You know, they leapt, you know, attacked Laish and renamed it Dan, just like they remained, renamed the river Ishtar into Danube. They renamed it, you know, they named, they named various geographical locations after their father. And later on, then Dan made another leap from Bastion to Greece and Spain and Ireland and Denmark. That's why I see, I told you how this, uh, uh, you know, how this Moses prophecy is very relevant for the world history, brethren. Did you notice to Greece, Spain, Ireland and Denmark? And Dan put his name in these places as well. The Greek Danaoi are the Irish Tuatha de Danaans. We also find Danslo, Dansover, Danmonism, Dundalke, Dundrum, Donegal Bay and Donegal City, Danglo, Londonderry, Dingle, Dungarvan, Dunsmore, the Don River in Scotland and in England, as well as River Dune in Scotland. The, the Psalter of Cashel, it's one of those historical writings, like an archive, like records, historical records, like annals, it says that the Tuatha de Danaans, the tribe of Dan, ruled Ireland for, for about two centuries and were highly skilled in other arts from their long residence in Greece and intercourse with the Phoenicians. End of the quote. Now, when the Assyrian ruler Tigla, Tiglath Pileser Pilis, who is mentioned in the Bible, when he invaded northern Israel in 1741 before Christ, that's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 20. Brethren, there is no mention of Dan being invaded. 
and this indicates that they migrated by sea. The invasion is mentioned of Naphtali, Gilead, and Galilee. They are mentioned, but you know the Danites are not, because in uh, I think it's Judges chapter five verse seventeen, it's written that Dan lived on ships. You know many Danites were good with seafare; they were good sailors, and logically, as they saw an invasion approaching. They didn't sit with crossed arms, they just sailed away. Now Dan moved to Egypt, when you see Genesis chapter 46 verse 23, about Israelites coming into Egypt, Dan moved to Egypt with one son, Hushim. He's also called in the Numbers 26 verse 42 and 43, he's also called Shuham. Now two of Shuham's descendants were called Danaus and Cadmus. Greek history tells us that Danaus and Cadmus fled from Egypt and arrived in Greece at the same time as the exodus of Israelites under Moses from Egypt. You find this in Petanius History of the World. Now in the Greek chronology, Facti Hellenici, you'll find that Cadmus' expedition occurred 310 years before the fall of Troy, which was in 1183 before Christ. And thus, brethren, 1493 before Christ, the very year of the Exodus, or very near to it, you know, Hecateus of Abdera in the 6th century before Christ confirms that the most distinguished of the expelled foreigners from Egypt followed Danaus and Cadmus into Greece, but the greater number were led by Moses into Judea. Well, you see, that shows to us that not all Israelites who left Egypt rather went to the promised land. You remember the Simeonites, when we talk about the Simeonites, due to their argument with Moses, many of them didn't go into the promised land. Now we see the same is true about the tribe of Dan. Now Diodorus Siculus says that the aliens were driven from the country and the most outstanding and active among them banded together and as some say were cast ashore in Greece and certain other regions. Their leaders were no notable men, chief among them being Danaus and Cadmus. But the greater number were driven into what is now called Judea, which is not far distant from Egypt and was at that time utterly uninhabited. The colony was headed by a man called Moses, outstanding both for his wisdom and for his courage. And of the quote. This is a quote from the other Cyclos. So Greece, brethren. They came to Greece, then many Danites, again being great seamen, they went to Ireland, conquered the tribes of Ireland, ruled Ireland. You see, it is so amazing, this how Dan was leaping, the Moses prophecy about Dan leaping, you know, from one area to the other. Now, the sea voyage was no really great problem. Yes, in Judges chapter 5, verse 17, you'll see that there were Danites, a seafaring people who abode in ships. So therefore, that they would sail away like this was not a big deal for them. So, you know, many of them went, fled the promised land by ships. Some of them obviously didn't even enter into the promised land. But the rest of the Danites went to Judea with Moses. As we have just said, we have just read how they got, they were the last tribe to get their portion of the promised land. And they received a very small allotment of land as their inheritance which was, brethren, inadequate for their needs. So Joshua gave them permission to expand beyond the borders of Cana, Canaan, the Canaanite land. So they went up the Jordan Valley, and they settled first at Laish, which they remained then. After a while, they moved on to Smyrna. Now Smyrna, you know, the city of Smyrna is in Asia Minor. And then they moved to Greece. So they, as they moved to Greece, once they marched out of the promised land, brethren, they just marched out of the Bible history because God's eyes are on the promised land and the Bible is the record of that land. When God you know, takes people out of his sight, the phrase simply means away from the promised land. So the tribe of them went away from the promised land and then jumped to Greece, jumped to also Spain, you know, as they were seafaring people, jumped to Ireland. And among them, as you know, there was, a, uh, there was the Judah line of Zara, which was the royal line, because Judah was entitled also, the Zara, uh, Zara descendant of Judah was entitled to have a royal family. So he established it. 
he could he wasn't able to establish in the promised land because the uh, his brother's line Pharaoh's line was established there through the king King David and his descendants but the Zarahite line royal line was established in the you know scattered Israelites namely in Ireland we spoke about that when we when we analyzed the commission of the prophet Jeremiah now as you see most of the Danites did not go into the into Assyrian captivity many fled brethren the bulk of that tribe had left their promised land before the time of Jeroboam the second as they do not appear in the genealogy of first chronicles chapter 5 and these Danites attacked their kinsmen the Zarahites in Troy and fought the Trojan war they became the ruling people in the country of Greece and were the Argive Danai, Danai who are mentioned in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Now the Greek philosophers, <laughs> what a shocking revelation, were Irishmen. The Greek classics were histories about the Irish. Herodotus tells us that the Lacedaemonians or the Spartans were in his day the most powerful and eminent branch of the Dorian Greeks. He also says that they were the most learned of the Greeks and that they wore a linen tunic with a fringe hanging round the legs and their religious customs forbid wearing wool in a temple. If you know anything about the Bible, uh, Bible commandments, instructions in the Old Testament, you will realize the parallels here. And they also have no, have no dealings with strangers. That's what Herodotus wrote about them. Now, they were obviously kindred with the house of Heracles in Sparta, which, who was Samson the Danite. And in one of the books, which is not canonical, 1 Maccabees chapter 12, even though it's not a canonical book, it's historically accurate, brethren. So from a historical point of view, reading the book of Maccabees, is, uh, there is nothing wrong with that because it's all record of true events. In any way, in, that, in 1 Maccabees chapter 12, Jonathan, the high priest, wrote to the Lacedaemonians, and uh, he says there were letters sent in times past unto Ananias, the high priest from Darius, who reigned then among you, to signify that you are our brethren, as the copy here underwritten does specify. We therefore at all times, without ceasing, both in our feasts and other convenient days, do remember you in the sacrifices which we offer and in our prayers, as reason is, and as it becomes us to think upon our brethren. Now, interestingly enough, then, you know, Jonathan closed the copy of those earlier letters, which states, Arius, king of the Lacedaemonians, to Ananias, the high priest, greeting. It is found in writing that the Lacedaemonians and Jews are brethren, and that they are of the stock of Abraham. Now, therefore, since this is come to our knowledge, you shall do well to write unto us of your prosperity. We do command, therefore, our ambassadors to make report unto you on this wise. Interesting enough, it's written again in the historically accurate book, First Maccabees, verse 12. So that the tribe of Dan, the Spartans, were kindred kinsmen to the Jews. Of course, because they were descendants of the tribe of Dan. Now, in the history of Ireland, written by Moore, it says that Irish bards tell us that the Tuathade Danan, after sojourning sometime in Greece, set sail for Ireland. Ireland and the Psalty of Cashel confirms this by saying the Tuathad de Danans ruled in Ireland for about two centuries and were highly skilled in architecture and other arts from their long residence in Greece and their intercourse with the Phoenicians. Now this is interesting with the Phoenicians because you know Gladstone's Juventus Mundi testifies that the Tuathad de Danan of Ireland came from the Danai of Greece. And some Phoenicians also came to Ireland and settled in the south. Certain Irish today claim descent from them. These are the Fenians or Phoenicians, the part of Spain conquered by the Phoenicians. And, you know, that part was called Ice Fine. So that is from the Phoenicians. It's written in the Chronicles, Chronicles of Airy. So we find that, you know, traces of Dan all over the European continent. We find it in the river Danube. In the other river names, Dnieper, Danaster, uh, you know, Danapris, Dniester and Dnieper. They're all rivers that are 
basically the area over the Black Sea. That's the area where the captured Israelites started migrating northwest and uh, to their new homeland. We find various traces of them all over Ireland, the names of their the names of their cities and towns, Donegal, Londonderry and so on. We find some traces also on the British Isles. We find the traces in Denmark, the resting place of Dan. And we can now see how, especially through the Irish people, the prophecies of Jacob and the prophecies of Moses were fulfilled and are being fulfilled in our day and age.